Is it an invasion of somebody's privacy? It's problematic for a number of reasons. People don't know who has what data about them, how this information is going to be used, the extent of the possible uses down the horizon. Will the government be able to get a hold of this information? Will the information be used for background checks for employment? Do people have any say in saying, no, I don't want it used in this way? Well, do they? Currently, they don't have a lot of say because a lot of people don't know even who's gathering the data and even that they have it, let alone have the ability to exercise their right to say, hey, wait a second, I really don't like this. Well, I'd like to thank everybody for coming today and talk a little bit about the status of federal legislation as it relates to security breaches. Axiom is well aware of the thorny privacy issues involved with a company that deals with people's personal information. That's why it has Jennifer Barrett, one of the first privacy officers in corporate America. It's a position Barrett's held since 1991. The world was very different. You know, we didn't have the internet. We didn't have the kinds of information that we have today. But as the 90s uh, moved into the new uh, century, information became more critical to our clients and more information became available. How do you address those who who start to say, wait a second, privacy? Come on, you've got all my information. That doesn't seem private. They need to look at it from a standpoint of why do we have that information and what it's used for. Axiom brings information to companies that want to market to consumers and helps them understand what might be relevant to a particular household. She really has it down. She knows how to explain what her company does and how to convince the public that it's not a big deal. Now, I think that she's wrong. I think that what her company does is very invasive. They have files on basically every American. They know information about how much money you make, about whether or not you have children, what your interests are. After 9-11, it was the government that was interested in Axiom's information. The FBI issued a subpoena, and Vice President Cheney got personally involved. Cheney really asked for a briefing just to understand himself what the private sector could do to help with it, you know, the problem. The Attorney General was involved and uh, you know, several other people in the Department of Justice. Despite Morgan's contact with the Vice President and the FBI, Axiom's business with the federal government remains tiny. Not so. It's ever-growing mound of data. Yeah, it just goes on and on and on. You mentioned information is just exploding. I mean, this is not going to stop. It's only going to continue, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. 20 years ago, it was too expensive to even store this data. Now, instead of storing six months of history, we store six years of history. In 2003, some of that data was hacked from one of Axiom's servers. The company now says it has one of the most secure networks in the world. But these days, the proliferation of information is so extensive that computer hackers don't need to break into highly secure databases in order to find valuable information. In fact, sometimes the most private of things can be found in the most public of places, on Google. Johnny Long is what's known as a good guy computer hacker. He works as a researcher at the Computer Sciences Corporation from these offices near Baltimore, Maryland. It's his job to advise companies on the security of their networks, and as part of that job, he tries to break into those networks. But before he employs some of his more complex hacking techniques, Long uses Google, because he's found that a simple search of the Internet using Google can turn up enough personal information to make a bad guy giddy. You can see here that we have credit card information, expiration dates, we have folks' names, we have their addresses, their phone numbers, PayPal IDs, eBay IDs, and passwords. The information Long can find using Google is in almost every case not intended to be shared with the entire world. It normally results from people or organizations unwittingly putting sensitive information on the Internet. Google search technology doesn't differentiate between what is private and what's not, so if it's on the Internet, Google is going to find it, keep it, and make it available to everybody else. 
the parade of personal information seems endless. This was a report that was put out by a city. They were having trouble with their residents paying their water bills. So what they did is they created this document that included the person's full name, their address, how much they owed, and their social security number. A lot of search engines have the ability to say, just give me Excel spreadsheets. And you can see we're able to find things like expense reports. This was a search that we did for phone bills. Okay, so you have this person's name, you have their phone number, and you can see all of the charges. This is one that was pretty scary, the actual Equifax credit report. So this lists somebody's entire credit history. This sort of searching is definitely something that's happening. It's part of the bigger identity theft picture. This is definitely something that the bad guys would do. August 2002, a peaceful night on a beach near Jacksonville, Florida, is shattered by a horrendous crime. Uh, I think somebody's been shot. Do you see a gunshot wound, sir? Do you see him bleeding? Is there a gun, gunshot or a stab? The injured man was Justin Barber. I was grabbing him. I was trying to do whatever you I was trying to grab that gun. He told police that he and his wife were walking on the deserted beach when an unknown gunman shot them both. Justin Barber was wounded. April Barber was dead. Police suspected Barber may have had a role in the death of his wife. And as it turned out, Barber left behind evidence he never dreamed even existed. Like millions of Americans, Barber searched the internet for information. And like most Americans, he used the search engine Google to do it. Barber kept the results of those searches on the hard drive of his laptop computer. But even if he had deleted them, they would have been kept somewhere else. At Google. Google keeps a record of every search that has ever been conducted by anyone who has used it. And in most cases, those searches can be tracked back to the specific individuals who conducted them. Right now, the default rule for Google and pretty much all of its competitors is that they keep everything. They have a log of every search made through Google since it started in the dorm rooms at Stanford. What you Google for defines you. A log of your searches on Google or any other search engine is, is practically the closest thing to a printout of the contents of your brain that we've ever seen. It indicates your political leanings, your religious leanings, your medical concerns, your sexual concerns, a vast array of sensitive data that in the past no one ever had. I started yelling for April. And running up and down the beach. It is clear. So while Justin Barber was telling police his story about how his wife died, the record of his Google searches made a few months before the shootings was telling a very different story. Investigators turned up queries such as trauma cases, gunshot right chest, and life insurance homicide. Barber was charged with April's murder. There was a Google search in which the keywords trauma cases Gunshot, right, and chest were the searches that were used. His Google queries were part of the evidence used during his trial. We the jury find the defendant, Justice Murders Barbara, guilty of first degree premeditated murder as charged in the indictment. In July of 2006, Justin Barber was convicted of murder and sentenced to life without parole. The case of Justin Barber is just one example of the ways Americans are being watched more closely than ever before.